Hey everybody, welcome. Um, thank you all for coming out to uh, today's Media Lab Talks. Um, our event today is called Undocumented Students, Equal Access to Higher Education and Freedom University, Georgia. We are incredibly lucky to have a great group of people here. Um, let me just quickly say my name is Ethan Zuckerman. I teach here at the MIT Media Lab, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the event in a moment. Uh, but I want to go down the line and introduce you uh, to some of the friends that we're really happy to have here. Uh, right next to me is Bethany Morton. Uh, she's one of the Freedom University founders. Uh, she's also a professor of history at Dartmouth. Uh, we've got Bettina Kaplan, uh, also a Freedom University founder and associate professor of Spanish at the University of Georgia. Um, Going further down, we have Keish Kim. Uh, she's a PhD student at Harvard. Um, she works with PUSH, which is Protect Undocumented Students at Harvard. Uh, going further down, we have Gustavo Madrigal. Uh, he's one of the founding students of uh, Freedom University, Georgia, and he is a immigration paralegal and also an immigration activist. Uh, and then at our end, we've got uh, Pamela Vogel, who's a uh, Freedom University founder, associate professor of history at Dartmouth. Did I roughly get everyone's names and affiliations? Okay, awesome. That's the main thing I have to accomplish here. Um, but I also have to tell you the ground rules of what's going on here. We have an event um, that is here live in this space, but it's also being recorded. It's also being streamed live out on the web. People who are watching it are going to be tweeting at uh, hashtag ML Talks. If you see me playing on my phone, it is not that you are not interesting. It is that <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what people are saying on the web instead of bringing them into the conversation as well. Um, that's part of my job as well. This is the first of two events. We have the live event here. We're also going to have a smaller event, which is entirely off the record. Uh, and that is going to be in the civic media space that immediately follows after this. Uh, and so that's an opportunity for people who aren't comfortable being on stage or may have questions or things that they want to talk about that they don't want broadcast out to the rest of the world, and we have a space for that as well. Um, but our conversation here is really um, about three subjects. It starts with uh, the Disobedience Prize, um, which you saw launched here at the Media Lab this past summer. Um, that was an attempt to um, show some of the exciting things that are happening around the space of pro-social disobedience. We ended up honoring four winners of that award. Uh, one of those four winners was Freedom University Georgia. We have five of the founders who are involved with that on stage with me today. And this is going to be an opportunity for us to talk about what Freedom University Georgia has been trying to accomplish, but really around this larger question of undocumented students, access to education, and transforming the educational system so that more people uh, have access to higher education at places like the University of Georgia and also places like MIT. And we're going to end up talking a little bit about uh, what MIT has been doing around these issues uh, for good or for ill as well. Um, so before we jump in uh, and start by uh, putting some of the students and then the professors on the spot, I'm wondering if we can go to this video. And this is a trailer for a documentary that has been documenting what's been going on with Freedom University Georgia. So if we can go to that, uh, that would be great. Hello, me. Hey, what's up? We are on the plane, y'all. We're about to take off. I asked for her phone number. I actually no, said, you didn't ask me. Your friend asked I actually me. said my friend. Yeah, that was childish. They told me, like, nah. <laughs> My dream, to be honest, is to be an astronaut, but... He's talk with a third grade dream. Nah, stop making fun of it. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not. I'm not. I said, no, okay. It's right. It's right. It was two. <laughs> I got an education. I graduated. I've been really lucky. So there wasn't really any obstacles until now that I want to go to college. I'm a very smart student. 
I can mess around a lot, but I'm very smart. But yet I'm here working, wasting my life. My grandmother would always tell me to be careful in this. If someone was to ask me, are you illegal? To say that I was a citizen, that I was born here. My mom got stopped. The cop pulls us over and found that she didn't have a license. And he said that he had to take her in. Like, what's the point? I'm not gonna make it here, they don't want me here. We are involved in a war on terror, and after all, these are undocumented. That's the point, really. We don't know who a lot of these people are. There are people that are purposely out to make your day miserable, make your life less. Let me tell you, when I received DACA, I took a risk, not only for me, but for my family. They knew my address. So to say that they don't know who we are, it's a lie. One, two, three. Undocumented! <laughs> I'm not leaving until they come and get me. I'm a Georgia boy. All I've ever known is Georgia. I don't really want to leave. Undocumented! 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 I'm not scared. Like, I'm just not. Now we just fight harder and we fight smarter and we fight as one. So we're having this conversation here at MIT at um, a very interesting and very fraught moment in time. Um, we have a group of people in the United States who have grown up in this country, have gone to school in this country, who in many cases don't know their citizenship status uh, until they're in the process of applying to college or sometimes at the process of uh, looking for financial aid. Um, we had limited protection for undocumented people in this country under DACA. Uh, through some political machinations, we are now in a state uh, where DACA is no longer on the books, is suspended, and there are now negotiations happening between the President and Congress over the future of undocumented uh, people who've arrived in this country as children who through no personal decision of their own find themselves in a situation where they're undocumented. And as an educator in this country, this is an enormous sort of moral and practical challenge. How do we provide the education to students who want the chance to learn, uh, but who don't have uh, the paperwork, don't have um, the rights in some states uh, to go and attend those state universities. And so my friends who've been involved with Freedom University Georgia have been very insistent that we center this conversation on the experience of students who found themselves, like the students in the video, looking at the situation and sort of deciding how do you go further. And so uh, Gustavo Madrigal, I'm hoping that you might help us and sort of talk about your experience as a student and how that ended up sort of informing Freedom University Georgia. Yeah, so thank you so much. Um, and I guess I really have to start uh, at the end of my junior year and going to my senior year. Um, so at the end of my junior year, I thought that I was going to go to college with my friends uh, and that I was going to use the Hope Scholarship, uh, which is the state scholarship uh, in Georgia, to be able to pay tuition. Um, then I found out through talks with my counselor that I was not going to be eligible for the, for the Hope Scholarship. And uh, that I, I think uh, I remember just sort of being in, in the room with her and um, then you know, she stopped beating around the bush and just straight up asked me, 
are you illegal? And I said yes. And I didn't know exactly what that meant, right, at the time. Um, I knew that I was undocumented in some way, but I didn't really know what the extent of that was until I found out that I wasn't going to be able to go to college, just like I had planned with my friends. Um, and, you know, I, at the end of my junior year, I had a 3.9 GPA, which went down to a 3.3 by the end of my senior year because my senior year, I didn't really care anymore. I saw no point of, you know, keeping the, the work that I had been doing going. Um, and so I sort of just stopped. Then I graduated, and uh, then in September of 2009, I had a, um, a very, very bad car accident. And when I came back, uh, you know, I thought, okay, like, is this really what my life is going to be now? Um, is this really who I want to be? Do I want to give up on trying to go to college? And back then, I didn't know, right? I didn't know that just like me, there were hundreds of thousands, there were millions of people in the same situation. And it wasn't until after that car accident uh, that I, when I was recovering, I was stuck at home. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't work, which was the main thing keeping me going then. Um, and so I, I did a search for illegal students on, on Google. And the first thing that came up was a, uh, an article on the DREAM Act and then a, a small like, portal on the web uh, that was uh, a meeting place for undocumented uh, youth from all over the country. And uh, that's sort of when I started getting involved with the, uh, with the activism that, uh, that was happening in, in Atlanta. Um, and back then, the group was called the Georgia Dreamers. Uh, and I started getting involved with them because what they were doing is they were trying to mobilize as many people uh, for the DREAM Act as possible. And then uh, in late 2010, we actually were able to push the DREAM Act up for a vote. And we got a vote, and then it failed. It passed the House, uh, but it didn't pass the Senate. Uh, and that was, I think, a lot of us credited to five Democrats who decided to vote against it and killed it um, by, by voting against it. And so I remember, I remember then there was, this, um, there was this anxiety within the youth who were a part of the Georgia Dreamers, right? Um, and that anxiety was, uh, you know, can we do what we think is the most important work uh, without having any limitations placed upon that work um, from you know, an organization that we were part of then? Um, and we decided that yes, we could do that, but that it would require having a different group. It, it would require having a different structure, and it would require having accountability to each other. Um, and then after, so after 2011, the Dream Act, or you know, in 2011, um, we decided that the fight was no longer at the federal level. So it wasn't anymore about trying to push the Dream Act at the federal level because we were fighting against. Many things, uh, but specifically in Georgia, we're fighting against HB 87, and that is uh, like the SB 1070 copycat law that passed in, um, in, in Georgia, and those laws are still in the courts. So at any point it, with, you know, in the next few years, we could, we could see a decision that says HB 87, SB 1070, these are all legals, right? So these horrible, horrible laws might actually be uh, enforced. Um, and, uh, and so we were also fighting secure communities and HB 87, which were these programs uh, where local law enforcement cooperates with immigration customs enforcement to try to streamline that process of deportation Deportation for as many people as possible who end up being booked into local police stations. And, and HB 87 was a law that could essentially require uh, all local law enforcement to essentially act as immigration officials and, and demand to see people's papers. So obviously mm -hmm. incredibly threatening to any undocumented population. When these laws came around, were, were you in school at this point? What, what had happened to you after high school? You got involved right. with dream activism. Where had you wanted to go to college? Were you planning on going to the University of Georgia? 
Uh, not the University of Georgia. I was planning to go to Kennesaw State University, um, and I actually was no longer in school when I started getting involved. I graduated high school in 2009. Um, in 2009 is where I had my accident, and sort of that's where you know it, it all began. Um, but uh, while you know while I was fighting these these laws, or while, while we were fighting these laws, I was no longer in school, and so that definitely was a protection that you know that you lose once you get out of once you graduate high school, right? You're no longer a student, you're just another adult who's right. undocumented and who's vulnerable. Yeah. And, um, and what, what are the laws in Georgia as far as attending a state university as an undocumented student? Well, uh, so, um, you know, as we were fighting HB 87, as we we're fighting SCOM, Secure Communities, and H, uh, and uh, what is the other one? 287G. Um, the, yeah, the ban came. There's too many, too many things. Um, but yeah, then the ban came down, uh, which said that undocumented students could not attend the top five research universities in the state of Georgia. And it also included language that said that any college in the state, any public school in the state of Georgia that had that had uh, rejected a qualified applicant. And for the purposes of this ban, qualified meant someone with lawful status or a US citizen, that any institution that had rejected a qualified applicant in the last two years could no longer accept undocumented students. Now, um, undocumented students not only, you know, couldn't really go to these, these top five universities, but also the ban was, was created so that it could spread out, right? right. Um, and, uh, you know, we couldn't pay in-state tuition. Uh, we think. couldn't pay out-of-state tuition. Right. We had to pay international rates, which are four times higher than, than uh, in-state tuition. And so that's sort of where, uh, you know, the fight turned away from, well, not away, because we were still trying to fight uh, secure communities, right. 287G, right. HV87, uh, but then it opened up another front, which was the educational front. Uh, so, so here's a law in Georgia that is significantly more restrictive than a lot of states. A lot of states have essentially said, for undocumented students, we can't give you in-state tuition, but you can pay out-of-state tuition. In Georgia, you've gone even further and essentially said, if you can get in, uh, you'll be paying the international tuition at a much higher rate. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, um, you're not admitted to the top five research universities in the state. And for the rest of the universities in the state, if they have rejected anyone, in the last two years, mm -hmm. uh, you are not uh, allowed admission because you might be taking that slot from an otherwise rejected student. What did you yourself find yourself doing at this point? You, you're already at this point an activist. You're already working against uh, HB 87 and then these other laws that are on the books. Um, but I, I know the end of the story. You're, you're a paralegal. You're an immigration uh, advocate. Did you get to go to college? How did this end up happening? Yeah, so I, I did end up going to college. Um, so while we were, you know, while we were fighting these, these things, um, the idea for Freedom University was born, I think, within uh, uh, the professors who are here. Um, and and Keish and you know a, a, a bigger group of people, um, and at that time the the group that we had decided to create so that we could be accountable to ourselves and not to some higher power right that could dictate what we what we did was called the Georgia Undocumented Youth Alliance or GUIA, and. Um, then, I mean, I, I think then that's sort of when these, the, the professors and the groups linked up, right? And, and the idea of Freedom University became a reality. Um, and uh, for me, at least, it was going through Freedom University and learning about these resources and learning about the fact that, you know, while I was no longer in school, I had been out of school for years, um, and I had also lost hope, right, that I could continue, that I could try to do this, um, that, uh, you know, having this team of people behind me and working with me uh, would help me, and eventually I, I ended up uh, getting a full ride to Hampshire College in Western Mass. 
um, and uh, and that's how I was able to to go to college. And I, you know, if it wasn't for for the people here and Lorja who couldn't be here, yeah. I remember uh, one. Uh, it was 4 a.m. on <laughs> in November of 2011. She called me up and. I was still half like half asleep, and she asked me, "Have you applied to any any places?" And I said, "I haven't." Yeah, yeah. And she just she went off on me, and she was like, "No, no, no! I need you to get up. Yeah. I need you to start applying. I need you to start writing the essays. Yeah. And you know, at five, I want you to send me the the essays that you wrote so that we can edit them, and then yeah. you can then you can uh, continue writing them." And so. Um, that's that that kind of push, right? That's I mean that that's the kind of push that that we also right. needed because we were so focused on on all these things that we had to push right. back against right. that we forgot to push ourselves towards the goal that we wanted to attain. Um, that I think at that point became this this abstract idea of. If we can, if we can manage to get to a good point here, I might be able to to go to school. Right. But you, now you, it's you more saw for the people who are on their to, way to win the movement first, and then have that opportunity. And actually, one of the things that that Freedom University helped you do is sort of go from. Um, not being able to go to school to going to one of the most selective liberal arts colleges in the nation uh, and now finding yourself sort of committed in, in the longer term here. Kish, can, can you talk about your story, about, uh, about sort of how you got involved with this as well? And then I, and then I want to talk to the professors about how they, they ended up sort of maybe meeting the other side of this equation. Right. No, I think uh, Gustavo did an amazing job laying out sort of the, the all the outside forces that was making us feel and being, you know, um, um, sort of stuck in a certain kind of social and political space, right? So I was in a very, very similar space. Um, I, I had always known that I was sort of undocumented, not really knowing the repercussions of it at all unless, until it was college time, which a lot of the stories often go is when students are trying to obtain higher education um, or the, another story is about the driver's licenses things, right? right? Trying to access um, just, just day-to-day -day, like livelihood that we sort of meet these barriers and realize that we cannot have those access. Um, so I, I was very similar in that, in that trajectory. Um, I had went into my counselor, guidance counselor in Georgia, um, trying to figure out how I can go to school, how can I afford school. Um, and uh, his answer was that I, that I couldn't. Uh, he doesn't really understand how, what should be done. So I did my own route. I applied to several state schools. I applied to the, all the schools that my friends were applying to, Georgia State, uh, Georgia, UGA, so University of Georgia, Georgia Tech, Georgia State, a bunch of all the colleges around. Um, I applied to a few out of state for some reason. I applied to Auburn, I applied to Emory, uh, so that's, that was a private university. Uh, but it ended up being down, going down to the cost. Yeah. So there's how can your family who are also undocumented and working, you know, under the table nine to five or even more hours, multiple shifts, multiple for jobs low for low pay mm -hmm. to afford an international rate, which is like, what, 50,000, 60,000 a year. I couldn't. Yeah. Um, so my no frustration. No access to loans. Either. No, no access to loans. So mm -hmm. you needed as a U.S. citizen to sort of like guarantee and be a benefactor, like be a co-signer. As an undocumented person, who do you have access that can be a co-signer to a <laughs> right. to a what hundred twenty thousand dollar loan? Nobody. Nobody. Even even with papers. Mm -hmm. Even as a citizen. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I met that barrier. I also graduated in two thousand nine, um, and I went into. A, a, a bad place where, one, I couldn't get a, a job. Um, I was helping my parents. Uh, I was working at a flea market. Mm -hmm. um, I was frustrated. I was really scared. I felt that um, my parents' whole reasoning coming to the U.S. was sort of down the drain. Um, and that was a lot of burden on my, that I carried on my part. Um, I was naive. I was determined. Um, to go to school, so I, I started doing like solo studying, which looking back now wasn't very <laughs> effective. Um, but I, I did, I, I, re, I tried to redo the SATs. I tried to read more. I tried to do all these test preps by my, on my own yeah. for a year and a half until I started organizing. Um, it was a, not a good place to be. And the whole premise on that for me was 
uh, you know, once in a while you will see in your local ethnic newspapers, so mine's Korean, Korean newspapers about success stories of like students who didn't have papers but went into Harvard or went into some super prestigious school and got a full funding. And um, I think that was my ultimate goal. Um, think, yeah, but uh, that's not sustainable. Uh, so I, I also reached out to a national organizer. I think at that time it was Perna Law, mm -hmm. who, was, uh, who was undocumented at that time, who is doing amazing work as a, um, in UC Berkeley, being the, the legal counselor and, and staff attorney there, or was. Um, and um, I reached out to them and was like, hey, I'm undocumented. Or at that time, we would use the word illegal. I used right. the word illegal. I was like, yeah. I'm illegal. I, need, I want to go to school. I need to go to school. Can you help me? And they had connected me to a fellow um, organizer and comrade, uh, Georgina, who was a stronghold in Georgia. Um, and that's when I had gone to the first meeting that led up to being the Georgia Undocumented Youth Alliance, yeah. SCUIA. Um, yeah, and how we got involved with Freedom U is, I think it was in, in culmination of everything, right? Mm -hmm. With SB, um, I was gonna say 1070, uh, with HB 87, with Policy 416, with all these legal pressure that's mm -hmm. happening, with a lot of students getting arrested, a lot of students um, being detained, right. putting in deportation proceedings, and we were fighting, we were trying to fight them, right? right? Um, that the professors were also concerned about their own students that they were that were around them, um, that were suddenly getting pressure to like one scope out and then to like kick out or one day they 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 got they lost funding right because of the policy four one six the students start the institutions start figuring out who are undocumented and uh, start requesting like higher funding right they right. need to pay certain bills and. Um, and they had reached out to Guya to ask for some advice, right? Right. So, right. so this had literally affected people who were in the school at that point for whom tuition might go up by a factor of four yeah. because suddenly their citizenship status became critical as far as how it was going. For you, you were not in school, but you oh. were starting to get involved with the undocumented rights movement, yes. with the dream movement. Yes. Let me now sort of bridge over to my friends who are teaching at University of Georgia at this point. And I'm sort of curious how, how you sort of ended up meeting and, and connecting at that point. So maybe Bettina, if I can, can I go to you first on this? Or? Okay, okay. Um, so in 2010, when, when the resolution against, the ban against undocumented students passed, um, many of us started uh, considering ways in which we could protest or oppose to, to the ban. Um, at that time, Pam and Bethany were, all very, were already very well connected and they can tell a little more with students' organizations who were protesting against the, um, the rates of um, uh, tuition and they were going up and the, the scholarships were going down, were shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there was a group of students in UGA, mostly uh, upper division and graduate students who were very engaged with uh, uh, access to higher education. Um, in my department, we, were, we had recently hired Lorja Garcia Peña uh, to, as uh, the specialist in Latino studies, and we- The only one in the entire state, right? Uh, most likely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now it has changed a little bit, but at the right time, yes. And it was a long fight to get this position uh, opened. And there was a group of us within the department who were thinking that the Latino uh, students, student body was growing and that we were not offering an, anything to them. So we were pushing for this to, to happen. We got it, uh, Lorja was there. And then we have this horrible news uh, that uh, would affect, affect mostly, not only, but mostly Latino students. Um, so uh, I, I remember once talking to Lorja in a corridor and saying, what are we gonna do? Uh, this is affecting us, this is against us. And at the same time, I think Pam invited me to a meeting with students and uh, community members 
And uh, in that meeting, we just started brainstorming on how to react directly to this, um, this ban. Um, I was following uh, the student movement, uh, Guya, what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, I was following in the news how young people were putting themselves to arrest. And I felt horrible that I, as a grown-up person, um, responsible for educating these people, was not doing anything. Mm. So at that point, we met, and there was a community member, Beto, who mm -hmm. very naively said, well, you three are teachers, or we four, I think there was someone else there. Why don't you teach them? They cannot go to college. Why don't you teach them? And I, we, we, after that, we started um, thinking in options and playing, toying with the idea, and immediately we decided that we couldn't plan anything without asking the students uh, what their needs were right. and how this idea of teaching a class would go with them. Right. Um, so that's when we met with a group of Guya students and Keish was there and we decided that it was the way to go and we started as a yeah. protest and also as a a way to support uh, this group of students. So Pam, my understanding of this is that this wasn't just a solidarity action, although it was certainly a big piece of that, but it was also a very practical, educational, how do we help students get to the point where they can find the resources to find a school that, that's willing to accept them and that they can afford. How did this actually work? Did you have mm -hmm. a classroom? Did you meet? What, what did you teach? How did, how did this work out? Yeah, I remember that the, during these organizational meetings, Keish in particular and Gina, who she referenced, um, were really pushing and saying, you know, what we want is to be in a, in a college classroom. And I think, if I'm not misreading this, that Guya was saying this would be politically incredibly useful to have this kind of, and it did attract an incredible amount of media. Um, and so we taught that class. And because of Lorja Garcia Pena, um, we were able to offer a kind of Latinx studies class as well as Latin American literature and culture and um, U.S. immigration from a more from a less Latinx kind of perspective um, or a broader perspective, perhaps. Um, and one thing became really clear is that while we were fighting the ban and while the students in the class were at the absolute cutting edge of that fight, um, there were people who had, like Gustavo and Keish, who had already um, graduated from high school two years before and were really ready to go to college um, and wanted to do that. And what we saw um, when we began to do things like SAT prep, we needed SAT prep books. And so, you know, the, the level of solidarity nationally was amazing. Just stacks and stacks of books, not only for this American Studies, Latinx Studies class we were teaching, but also for SAT prep books. Um, and then the kind of solidarity that came out of places that you, that were actually under-resourced, like Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi, a historically black college and university. There was an undocumented student there that went into the admissions office and said, you know, there's a lot more people like me who are being banned across the South, and especially in Georgia and South Carolina. You need to open up these scholarships. You need to open up the fellowships. And so one of the, the biggest receiving institutions that we found was one of the poorest colleges in the country. And the second one that was really fabulous was Berea College, who in the 19th century was one of the first colleges to integrate along racial lines and along gender lines. And in fact, in the 1920s, the Supreme Court came in and shut that down and said, you can't be in Integrated on along racial lines. And so Berea stepped up um, and said, especially when DACA passed and people were able to work, because it's a work study school, um, that they, they were able to provide scholarships. Um, the, the alumni at Hampshire, led by a woman who was herself a first generation student, um, you know, organized to, to, to come up with the money for, for Gustavo's, you know, four-year scholarship. Um, so what we saw was a lot of intense organizing and incredible solidarity coming from the HBCUs, coming from Berea, um, and coming from 
Um, you know, organizations in Athens, like they, we mentioned Beto, who was the head of the immigrant rights organization, from the African American women who, who ran the Economic Justice Coalition and already had networks. So that this is, you know, logistically to run something like this, you need drivers. That's always the issue yeah. in social movements <laughs> in the South, right? Is public transportation um, is, is non existent. And so we had these teams of drivers who were coming out of the Economic Justice Coalition. We were receiving death threats from the Klan and people like that. And so the Economic Justice Coalition provided someone who was out in the park parking lot while the students were meeting on Sundays for these three hour intensive classes um, to watch, you know, and not to call the police because that wouldn't do any good, right? So, you know, we had our own kind of protection system um, out of these pre-existing solidarity networks. And some of the people doing the drivers were Teamsters, people from the Racial Justice Action Center in Atlanta. Um, there were lawyers that came in from the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Southern Center for Human Rights that took on some of these cases because some students you know, broken taillights and things like that had um, had police records, and so if they're going to leave the state to go to college, that had to be ad addressed in, in in courtrooms and things. So one of the interesting things about Freedom U was the this incredible level of solidarity um, from these you know under resourced colleges and from these existing activist networks. I think. So, so when we think of this as four professors got together in an undisclosed location and held free classes for undocumented students, we're seeing like the tip of an iceberg yeah. of yeah. organizing that includes how do people get there, yeah. Yeah. how do you protect the people who are there, how right. do you think about this larger question of what, what the goal is of this. And it sounded like from very early on, the goal was not an alternative to being able to go to a university, it was it was the opportunity to to get in there. Um, and you and you have to realize that the the initial organizing act was this Gina that that Keisha has been talking about. Um, Guya comes out and does an organizing workshop for students in the Athens area. And Gina's first thing was everybody who's over 30 and everybody who's a citizen out of the room. And yeah. so they did the organizing. Them, them, it was Guya who was pushing this um, and was doing the logistical work because. You know, social movements are the reproductive labor, right? And so this was the group doing that labor and having that vision, right. I think. Um, and they were the ones that were connected to these activist networks in Atlanta yep. and things. Um, yep. And so put together this, you know, kind of took the befuddled professors and said, now look, you know, this is what you need to do. Um, I mean, I think that's real because I think, I, yeah, I don't know about you, Gustavo, but I think a lot of us were, yeah, you were too, dated, and then and very dated, and, and the aspect or perspective like going, being in a classroom or going to college was far from our minds. I think there's mm -hmm. a reason why Lord had to call you at 4 a.m., yeah. 5 a.m., and to ask you to write a paper and an application in an hour, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, I think when, even when Freedom University, before even we actually like claimed and embraced that name, we were just like, what does this classroom actually look like? What is it actually supposed to do? And when we were using our networks to like let the word out so that students actually were attending like and, and actually uh, you know taking up space for this classroom, there was a lot of like hesitancy and confusion of what what this was supposed to be. And, and Kish, what did what did it end up being? I mean, when when people were coming <laughs> to these classes, you know, what what was getting taught? Was it about doing a college level class in Latin X and American Studies, or huh. or was it about? thinking about what it would mean to be someone who was, was going into higher education? So there was a, I think in the beginning there was a lot of confusion. It was very amorphous. <laughs> um, there, was, there was a lot of questions, right? People were asking for all kinds of classes. For me, at that time, I was very dead set on like having an actual classroom, like a college level classroom was what I personally wanted. And that was my personal investment. And then, um, so it, that, that definitely shown through that that was what I needed. Um, so we, that's what we had stated. Um, looking back now. <laughs> I, I remember in our first <laughs> meeting, uh, Keish um, was very eloquent and she said something like, uh, I have lost my personality as a student and I want to be a student. Mm. So uh, after that, uh, in the class, she insisted that she right. was already, uh, again, a student. Right. That was a big gain. Yeah. I mean, so, so, that's in, so looking back now from where I am now, it's really ironic and, and funny that uh, there was a syllabus that was being drafted and, and compiled over the summer. 
like just multiple drafts. I remember y'all were pages. 17 pages. It was a very rigorous. It was actually a very rigorous. I still have it with me, and <laughs> it, was like, it, it was a very rigorous it was syllabus. Beyond graduate school. It was. It was actually beyond graduate school. And now that I'm in, I know that it was beyond graduate yeah. school level. <laughs> The funny thing was, and then there was, it was a very, I think a lot, even the naming of the classroom, even naming of Freedom University, there was a lot of power and intention behind it. Mm -hmm. So the classroom, the class that was offered was uh, titled as American, American Civilization. <laughs> and this was a little wink at Harvard American Civilization program at that time. We had then, since then, changed our name to American Studies. <laughs> we still have a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, but the classroom, the, the, the syllabus and, and the syllabus and the class class was titled American Civilization, what happened actually behind and inside the syllabus was amazing, powerful critiques on empire, about statehood, sovereignty, about, and it was using all kinds of scholarship and sources that as ethnic studies, it was, it was, mm -hmm. it was American studies at its core. Right. We were reading, uh, we were really reading graduate level readings. We were reading George Lipsis. We were reading Cortez <laughs> Gonzalez. We were reading May all kinds of, May 9. May 9. Right. So, so I, I, I see Bethany laughing hard about this, and Bethany, of course, is a is an activist historian. You know, has thought a lot about um, labor history and about um, different uh, social movements. You know, sort of within the Americas. I mean, how how did you find yourself thinking about this? Sort of going into the classroom. Were you approaching this as a scholar? Were you approaching this as an activist? How how were you bringing yourself into this? Well, I mean, I think what Bettina said at the beginning, I remember the day that we opened the New York Times and there was the picture of Guya activists who had sat down on the street in front of the Georgia Capitol to protest these, um, the spate of laws, right? And you see these young people in uh, their graduation gowns, right, from high school, sitting down and being dragged off by the same beefy cops that we're all familiar with from, you know, 100 years of Southern iconography. And, you know, the reaction is, wait a minute, this is my institution that is now being directly yeah. conscripted into uh, this particular form of injustice. There has to be something strategic that you can do with with your own imbrication in the um, committing of this injustice. And so reaching out to the people who, who were risking and, and continue every day, every minute that they're up here to risk far more than any of us could risk, right, by doing this and just saying, is there any way in which our institutional location could be useful because none of us wants to participate in executing uh, this particular uh, ban, right? And, and to put this in context, it was the 50th anniversary of the desegregation yeah. of the University of Georgia. And so having fought that tooth and nail, right, the white state establishment at the time uh, was now patting itself on the back very publicly for the open access to, um, to the, the plantation style campus that, that was at the heart of this. Um, and so using those realities strategically, we wanted to know if, if the activists who were in fact uh, risking something could see a use for that, right? But when Keish came back with, um, actually the thing that would be useful for us would be if y'all would do this as a civil disobedience demonstration project and actually do it like you would do it, you know? Um, the fact was that this fight against undocumented students and racialized students was part of the whole move to ban an entire branch of knowledge from public universities, right? That, that while Arizona was passing these laws that Georgia was running along and copying, uh, it was also trying to throw ethnic studies out of um, it's institutions right. of higher learning. So it wasn't accidental that uh, Latinx studies was really a focus of this. This was in part what you were trying to exactly. fight for. Exactly, that the... American studies and Latinx studies, ethnic studies generally, African American studies, these are all branches of human knowledge that had to literally fight in the streets for inclusion in publicly funded education. Right. And so there's, you know, there's a, an awareness uh, at the in the room where these things happen, that that knowledge is dangerous. Right. That knowledge, liberatory knowledge is dangerous. Right. And it, you know, I, th I think it's fair to say that no one in the class had encountered the histories we were 
collectively constructing presented in right. any fashion, right? right? Mm -hmm. That that is part of the move. And so for us, it was uh, really powerful to get to participate in that knowledge creation right. with people who were um, mm -hmm. actively liberating our country right. um, at the same time. Yeah. Right. And I, I want to say that one of the effects of having such a powerful ethnic studies professor like Lorja Garcia Pena was um, that not only did we have the four of us teaching, we had people fly in. Yes. Yeah. Um, Mark Overmeyer Velasquez, Yolanda Martinez San Miguel, um, Ache Ovejas, uh, I, I could go on and on, Laura Gutierrez, flew in Sarah on their Haley. own dimes often, oftentimes um, to give classes at Freedom U. So arguably, we had the best ethnic studies curriculum <laughs> in the country at the time, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just, and, and without, you know, with no budget, essentially. And we yeah. were using sometimes jo the University of Georgia. But these were, this was an intellectually um, just over-the-top stimulating kind of experience to have this level. Juno Diaz, the famous Juno Diaz, the MIT professor, you know, Skyped in. And yeah. Keish got up and, you know, sort of <laughs> went after him. But that was... <laughs> Dale <laughs> duro. Um, but you know, there, I mean, people were empowered in dialoguing, and this was really a um, a magnet for, like I said, a kind of demonstration project in liberatory knowledge that lots of people wanted to participate in. I, but I'm as sure a, the, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, but as a student, so like, I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. in the classroom, we we are just just soaking it in. We don't. I mean, we're coming in because we have said and dedicated our time into the space. We don't know how, at what scale we're meeting these professors. <laughs> like, we don't know what their positions are, where they are in their, like, legal, I mean, scholarly genealogies. We do not know these things. What we were promised, and this was a constant push that we still have to do, mm -hmm. is actually get it accredited. So when it was, mm -hmm. the idea was brewing, it, the importance was getting the classroom accredited so that if we were to, um, you know, transfer or go to a two-year college, a community college, or even a four-year college, that the experience in the classroom that we were actually sitting on was being recognized right. as an right. uh, actual right. class, which we, we didn't still, right? We still haven't. Still not. Um, and that sort of morphed, and that push was happening while the application like, deadlines are coming up, mm -hmm. and we start then really pitching ideas of, okay, what does it mean for us to try to apply? Because now that we have access right. to professors, professors of a, a university, could they write us recommendation letters? Sure. Could they do this? And so these ideas are just forming as time went by. So there's an open question about could Freedom University turn into something that could have accreditation, could help people get credits right. that they might be able to transfer and bring somewhere else? You've built this program, which you know, even just in the first seminar is, is this sort of you know, extraordinary Latinx studies. Um, and, you're doing this on Sunday mornings, completely with volunteer labor, at an undisclosed location, so that the clan, that the fucking clan, doesn't show up to disrupt your activities. So I assume the University of Georgia was, was thrilled with this and, and was, was honoring the extra service. I, I assume they, they got rid of some of your teaching requirements for this, Bethany or, or Pam. I, 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 so I, I, I've noted that three of the four of you are no longer teaching at the University of Georgia. Uh, you know, B Bettina, what, how, did, how did UGA react to this? Um, they, you know, in, in, at the beginning, especially the press, was trying to um, put us against each other and they would go to the, uh, to the uh, UGA speaker and ask them, uh, what, what do you have to say about this? And the answer that the speaker gave was, the first answer was, uh, Mm, our faculty can teach whatever they want outside their schedule, and some professors teach, teach Bible school, and we don't care about that. Which is true. <laughs> Which is true. <laughs> so they pr pretty much put it in those terms and gave us some, in a way, freedom. Uh, so we didn't need to respond to, to that. Um, but that's whole, it's not exactly wholeheartedly em embracing it. No, let's no. be clear, there was plenty of retaliation. The, but, but up next to what other people had on the line, 
-hmm. in this situation, well, it was it, sure, you know, sure. okay. yeah. not worth worrying about, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say it's important to remember that the faculty at University of Georgia, the student body at University of Georgia, same at Georgia State, same at multiple other universities around the camp, uh, around the state, Armstrong State, voted resolutions against the ban um, in support of, um, of Freedom U or other actions that, then, that yeah. the larger all, immigrant. Right. All then, university councils, all yeah. university forums right. have at least one resolution against the ban where faculty were involved and, and, and students were involved. And public? And the interesting thing was that the administration wouldn't go to the Board of Regents meetings right. and say these things. And right. so there were the GUIA activists yeah. confronting the Board of Regents um, without, you know, with these sort of cowardly administrators not saying anything, just sitting in the audience while, you know, younger people took on this, took on this fight. Yeah. Um, and when we, uh, when we have the discuss discussion in UGA with the University Council, um, we proposed a resolution against the, the, the ban. We have a very strong reaction against the language that we were using. In the first proposal, we, are using, we were using the word discrimination. And our colleagues who were supporting Freedom University, who were against uh, the ban, they reacted very badly to the word discrimination. They couldn't tolerate that. And luckily, we were able to change that language and the resolution passed. But it, I think that speaks a lot about um, the position of uh, faculty, even when they are supporters, uh, how they uh, do not want to make connections with the past history of, of the state, and um, that creates a lot of trouble for them. Although a, a specialist in specifically in the history of living through segregation in Georgia was one of our most effective um, collaborators who came and, and spoke and made those connections herself, Barbara McCaskill, who runs a, a standalone project at UGA about the, the history of anti-black discrimination at UGA, um, had no trouble at all making those right, connections, right. right? So I want to open this up to, to the, the audience in a moment, but I just want to ask one specific question to, to everyone, and actually uh, starting with Kish. Um, I know that everyone who's been involved with Freedom University is both very proud of it, but also very insistent that it is not the only intervention, maybe not always the right intervention, that there's a need for a huge number of interventions to deal with these questions of access to education. Um, so Kish, you're, you're very involved with PUSH at yeah. Harvard. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And then I'd just love to go sort of down the line and hear what each of you is involved with right now. And maybe if there's anything you want to urge us as an audience, both here and online, to get involved with. Um, and, and Pamela, when we get to you, we're going to pull up the website associated with it. So. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's, I think Freedom University as well as Guya is still both ongoing. Um, the it, things have gotten worse, right? Mm -hmm. In many ways, mm -hmm. uh, we both of us have um, went into different trajectories of different institution, academic institutions, uh, pursuing different interests. Uh, but our, I mean, both of us haven't <laughs> fixed our statuses yet. No. Uh, um, and you know, while our scale and our, our network of people that we are in, interacting with and engaging with are, are expanding, the core issues and values are still the same. Um, so for me, currently being an American Studies PhD student at Harvard, um, after the recent elections, it was actually, again, working closely with Lorja Garcia Pena, who's currently a faculty there. Um, it was her classroom where we met after. Um, it was actually one of her, again, one of her amazing, powerful undergraduate classrooms that was being held Monday, Wednesday. So and on Monday before the election results, um, there was a very powerful performance, a camp on-campus performance of students just sort of doing these uh, murals and decorating the John Harvard statue of just doing this really amazing and powerful resistance acts. Um, and then we got the election result on Tuesday, went to class, um, and I had went in to be with the students. Um, and it was a very sorrowful moment. Yeah. One, we had to sort of cons console each other and recognize each other's pain. Um, 
And secondly, that's when we started writing, drafting a letter to our president um, and to our deans of what we needed. And that sort of became what uh, Protect Undocumented Students at Harvard sort of became. And we had multiple fronts of ask, which still have not been met, unfortunately. Um, and that had to do with uh, having an actual, like uh, a, a physical location, an office that is above ground. Um, um, that, that had actually invested money into students, protecting undocumented students. Mm -hmm. This meant in multiple fronts, not only allocating funding to support of uh, emergency financial aid that o not only covers DACA, but maybe other funds. Maybe our, our parents are being deported or being detained and then in, in deportation proceedings. Maybe uh, we need to help our parents sustain themselves because m our mom and dads are detained, right? Yeah. There's multiple fronts where financial need is actually needed that people do not always recognize. It's always the $495 for DACA renewals, mm -hmm. but there's so much more that goes beyond that. Um, what if it, we have mixed that? A lot of the students have, were mixed status. So the students themselves may have papers, but they, their parents, their brothers and sisters who may not have papers, right? So our needs were not only the funding, it was not only the legal, legal need of having a, a very a radical and, and powerful and insistent and stubborn a, a, a attorney, a criminal and both immigration attorney who's capable of pushing certain envelopes, right, mm. and making things happen. Mm. We, needed, we needed an, an attorney. We needed multiple attorneys. We needed a collection of attorneys who's able to do certain things. We wanted access to mental health. We wanted a, a capable mental health counselor mm. and a therapist who's able to meet the needs of not only LGBTQ, low-income, first-gen students, but a, a knowing various backgrounds of, like, what it means to be undocumented. Mm. Um, so these were some of the fronts that we needed. We will actually will ask for more hiring of um, uh, ethnic studies like professors and scholars. Um, multiple funds were, were asked. Uh, we're so so the, it, it, it's a huge set of needs. And, and, and just thinking about <clears throat> how enormous these needs can be and also how enormous these populations are. I was reminded when we were sitting down over lunch that you know, not only do we have the, the 800,000 people who have applied for DACA status or been granted DACA status, we have 1.3 million people who are eligible. Since DACA is not currently on the books, we have people who would be eligible for DACA but who are now sort of falling through the cracks. And then as you're mentioning, you have an even larger set of students who have mixed families. So the right. students have papers, one or both parents doesn't have papers, right. and you find students in a situation where, and I find this as an educator, I have a student who will drop off the map, yes. and what may actually be going on is that the student is working full time yes. mm. to keep her parents from being deported right. or to figure out what to do with the rest of the family if parents do end up getting deported. Yes. This whole set of needs becomes something that as educators, we have a responsibility to address right. up till the point that our government finds a way to, to address this better than they're, yes. they're currently addressing this now. Gustavo, what about, what about you? How are, how are you um, involved with this at, at, at this point? Do you continue to be involved with, with Freedom U? Or are you involved with other parts of the movement in, in New York at this point? Um, so I, I am not really involved with Freedom U anymore. Um, and in terms of organizing efforts, I've taken a step back. Um, but uh, one of the motivations for when I first got involved was if I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out with a bang, right? Yeah. Like, I'm going to make some damage. I'm going <laughs> to have an impact before they take me out. And I think that has translated into my work as a paralegal where, you know, I'm not necessarily working with people who, um, you know, uh, are highly skilled workers who, for whom, you know, it's, it's, there is demand, right? Um, and, and they want to bring them over. I'm working with people who um, are escaping all kinds of violence, are escaping poverty, are, are running away from, um, from, you know, these, these puppet uh, go governments that, that the U.S installed and and you know the uh, the the sacking of the resources of their countries and uh, being able you know and, and they're coming here for for a better life right they just want to work as, as we all do you know and, and lead a lead a good life and um, and I think that that's sort of where it's translated for me now right um, there are so many immigration cases out there there's there's 
clean cut ones where there's no criminal record. There's, you know, there's ones that are very, very complicated. And those are the ones that I like to work on. Yeah. Um, I like to work on the ones um, that uh, you know anyone who could just sort of look at the at the uh, surface details of it and say no, well this is not someone we want in this country. Uh, but it's not so black and white, right? Um, and so that's that's where I am now. I I eventually want to be an immigration attorney, and I want to keep working on this on this project of uh, you know there like people have rights and people are eligible eligible for immigration benefits under the INA. It may not be pretty, it may not be easy, there's going to be a lot of digging, a lot of fighting, a lot of advocating for, for, for people, um, but as someone who, ad, as of this point, doesn't really have, a, or does, doesn't have a path to uh, legalization, I, my mentality is still, I want to go out with a bang. And what that means is, you know, making sure that as many people who can adjust, who can try to obtain legalization, do that. And, and that's, that's, that's where my energies are now. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, eventually down the line, what I would uh, like to do, and one of the biggest goals for me is to be able to influence or write legislation that would go into the INA, right? That would be more humane and uh, not just necessarily look at people as what kind of economic contributions can you make to this country, um, but what does this country owe you? What does this country owe your family? How can we repay that? Um, and, and that's sort of the impact that I, that I want to have down the line. There, there's a law school uh, about two <laughs> stops away on the red line. And, uh, I've, got, I've got some friends over there. They often watch these events, so uh, they, they may want to get in touch with you about this. They're, they Let's they do some, after. They do some pretty good work there. Uh, pa Pamela, what about you? You're, you're now uh, up at Dartmouth College, uh, yeah. a, a noted uh, hotbed of, of liberal activism. <laughs> uh, what, 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 what's your involvement with the movement at this point? Uh, with Freedom U? Yeah. Um, I've, like Gustavo, who was being too modest, um, have helped a little bit with, like, s with tours of students coming through and doing educational work at places like Smith and, and Hampshire. Gustavo actually organized a tour of Freedom U students a couple years back in the Pioneer Valley, um, and they were able to um, you know, tell people what was going on. Freedom U is ongoing. Um, it's being run now by a young woman named Laura Mika Soltis, who's doing an absolutely fabulous job, and Freedom U students are sort of leading not only the undocumented student movement, in Atlanta, but you know, are major leaders in a larger kind of network of students who've done some pretty powerful civil disobedience actions, not only at the University of Georgia, but at the Board of Regents. Um, and so what we do at Dartmouth, which is sort of a, um, a place that probably is not quite where MIT is yet on, in terms of undocumented admissions, is educational work and a lot of working with students whose parents are in deportation hearings and getting professors to write letters um, that go to courtrooms in Georgia or Nebraska or Texas or wherever it is um, that talk about that student um, so that the judge might give a judge pause kind of thing. Um, but, but Freedom U is very much an ongoing, you know, kind of ongoing concern um, and continues to offer classes on Sundays and SAT prep. Yeah. Um, and I really want to encourage people to go to the website. And it's an organization that really could use your support. And if we can just pull up the website yeah. here, great. And, and what's the URL for that? Um, I think it's www.freedomuniversitygeorgia.com or .org maybe. Um, there it is, and it's, I would connect, there's, there's MIT professor Juno Diaz on the Colbert Report getting his FU Georgia t-shirt, a sweatshirt. Um, I, I was going to ask whether the name was intentional, but I, 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 <laughs> right? I know Bethany yes, well enough to know that the, the name absolutely was intentional. Yes, that we had no idea, yeah. apparently. <laughs> like, we like, wanted oh, to those be stupid we, adults Yes, but I've the... known you for a really, really long time, and I know that FU Georgia was something that probably yeah, We tried to argue that, that we wanted to be a freedom school to, you know, kind of come full circle to the freedom schools of the six but everyone's like, but if we're FU, we get to shout FU Georgia at the, mm -hmm. at the demonstrations. Which was um, cathartic. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyways, I, I would really encourage people to, you know, touch base with them, to donate if you can. As you know, most sort of donations to 501c3 organizations go to the left coast and not to the south. Yeah. So there's yeah. some, some of the most incredible political activism is going on in the US south with absolutely no resources. Taking students in a van to Berea College to interview there with admissions officers is a $3,000 venture. 
$3,000 seems like nothing at a place like MRT or Dartmouth, but it can go so far. Um, books, um, you know, materials, artistic, art, artist materials for demonstrations, all of that transportation, getting people on a plane to get to Hampshire to do a, to do a workshop. So I really want to encourage people, if you can give to give, um, share it on social media, if you get connected with them. Um, volunteer if you're in the Atlanta area. It really is like we were saying, it's a, it's a social movement as much as it is um, a single class on Sundays now. Um, and it's a social movement that grew with incredible solidarity from people all over the country, people flying in, people buying books, um, students organizing in Atlanta with Guya. So. So I, I actually want to open up at this point before we lose some of the wonderful guests that, that we have here. And we're going to keep going on with this conversation, both in a sort of open Q&A here. We're also going to move into, into MySpace and Civic to, to keep talking a little bit further on. But let, let me just open this up a little bit. Anyone um, have anything you want to ask these remarkable folks, the, the students, the professors, so on and so forth? Don't leave me hanging here with the question <laughs> cube. You know how much I desperately want to throw this at people within the audience. <laughs> throw some mic. Thank you, Joy. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> nice there. Oh. Hi, I'm Joy. I'm uh, part of the Center for Civic Media. Earlier you mentioned that when you used the word discrimination, you got pushed back from faculty. And in my own experiences of talking about issues within institutions, language comes up so much in terms of what people are willing to engage with. So I was, one, curious about how you thought about the language based on the pushback mm -hmm. and what language you would have wanted to use. And, and I'm going to cheat just for a moment and brag on Joy for a second. Joy is a, is a PhD student in my lab and has been doing um, really remarkable research demonstrating uh, some inbuilt biases in computer vision systems. And this is work that gets very tricky because it, it makes people uncomfortable. No one likes to be called out on biases built into systems, uh, but it's incredibly important to show what these biases are so that people have a chance to address them and make those systems better. So language and how we talk about this is something that's a, that's a big subject within our lab. We were certainly aware that we had a limited number of effective scripts available to us for the, the public leveraging of this, and that one of, it, one of them was, frankly, a uh, do-gooder, befuddled white teacher just wants to help the kids get books, you know, that that, that had an audience. And we talked a lot about uh, the trade-offs involved in playing to some of these scripts, the stand and deliver script that says that there's a category of innocent, deserving, no fault of their own immigrants uh, who came here as children who are still uh, effectively children and therefore it's not their fault. Um, and and it contra the sort of insistent uh, responsibilization neoliberal narrative that it, it, whatever befalls you, you have asked for it. Here's one category of people, this narrative says, that we can point to and say, okay, well, we'll give them special consideration, right? And there are real dangers, and I think it's, it's true in general that a lot of the dreamer movement has been incredibly ethically rigorous about refusing that narrative and not throwing other um, undocumented immigrants under the bus in pursuit of that particular. Um, I, I, I think the problem that, that it sounds like you're the expert on is how the technology of um, raceless discrimination is specifically designed to make it impossible to um, call out the elephant in the room, you know? And so it, for me, it was very important that we spent time with immigration history and looked at the ways that immigration has been specifically structured around race. Everyone's been completely aware of it at the time. The discussions in Congress are all about how can we keep the country white and yet not use the word race in this legislation. And when they figure it out, they all pat each other on the back. You know, over and over again, 1924, 1952, 1965, they're thrilled that they figured out a way to make sure that, quote, the unwashed Hottentots will not be coming here to take jobs from good, wholesome Americans. I mean, I think that's verbatim, right, out of the 65 debates. So the, the 
challenge is enormous to undo and, and refuse and, and um, not leave any space for that kind of deliberate um, erasure of what everyone knows is actually being talked about here. And I don't think any of us has an answer on that. We would probably be coming to you for guidance. But, but it's really interesting <laughs> to think about the ways in which Freedom University managed to position itself, I think, very successfully <laughs> as, oh my God, who could be against, you know, college professors getting together on a Sunday. And, the kids you know, just want to learn. Giving a chance for kids to learn. I, I, you got me, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, we, 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 you know, we ended up supporting this through the Disobedience Prize very much around that narrative. What's been so great in sort of having you here and hearing about this is the ways in which this was a student-led movement that essentially identified something that students needed and wanted, and then we're sort of able to go out and, and reach out to some professors who are willing to do it, but it was the students identifying that this was a missing part of the experience, a part of what people were being denied at that, at yeah, that point that, in time. I, I would like to point out to another struggle that I think youth movements also have, and we as organizers, organizers of Freedom University, and uh, now I'm in a different organization, you lead Athens, we still have, and is this idea of uh, the good immigrant and the bad immigrant, and how uh, these kids who want to go to come to MIT are the good immigrants, but their parents or their younger sibling who did not pass the AP test is the bad immigrant. Um, so I think from, from the perspective of um, the organizer or coordinator of an, of an organization that worked with undocumented students, uh, that is a big struggle. And um, I think you, you lead Athens is working on going around that uh, just um, by uh, working with mixed status uh, students and working with the students who were the last one in the classroom and yeah. um, never had an advisor who said, yes, you're doing well. Right, right. Uh, we're going after particularly that, uh, that student. Mm -hmm. Because people shouldn't have to be as extraordinary as these two people already were at 16 and 17 and 18 in order simply to not wake up every day with this hang up. You know, God knows we weren't, yeah. right? This is not about finding the, just the hyper qualified, incredible standout human being. And the people who build this movement are very clear that it's not about that. You do not need to be super stellar to go to college. Yep. And, and, and just, to, just to clarify, and you can add on, um, we weren't, I, I wasn't, I wasn't either. Uh, so when the process of, at least for me, I know my process even more, uh, my, my access to my undergraduate degree, which was at Syracuse University, another private institution, was actually a very strong and powerful network of transnational feminists, Chandra uh, Tapali Mohanty's there, yeah. and with Linda Carr, who are pushing their administrators to open up a private fund, a grant, a private grant. So these are happening in multiple levels, right? We're not only pushing for policies against, like in, in the public space. It's also happening back doors too. So like it really, really means a lot for like administrators, faculties to gather up a, a, a coalition to like come up with funding to support yeah. students if your institution doesn't publicly allow undocumented students to come through. So just recognizing that is really, really important and advocating for students who, are not, who does not have the 4.0 GPA, who does not have the perfect SAT score. I wasn't that student, but I had people who were advocating and advocating for me. So I'm going to come back to that question about what universities can do around this, and I'm going to put some of our friends from the admissions office on the spot. But let me um, just give you a chance to ask a question here. There's a, a warning label on the bottom of this that says I should read the user manual before using it, and I just want to be clear, I haven't read the user manual for the microphone. <laughs> this is the Media Lab. None of us have ever read a <laughs> user manual ever. It's actually they forbidden write the user within manuals. the... Yeah, yeah. Um, my name is Griff. I want to thank each of you for being here. Um, it's, you know, it's so clear that you have a lot to teach folks who are looking to support undocumented students, but it's also clear, listening to each of you, that you have so much to teach you know, folks working in higher education and universities across the board. And listening to you speak about the ways that um, 
you know, learning needs to be found in solidarity with the labor that is supporting learning through, you know, building relationships with drivers, the way you talked about co-constructing curriculum, you know, embracing learning as a political act. It, it just, I mean, you were mentioning earlier how you didn't know, you know, where your, uh, the professors were on their scholarly journal journey because they were treating you like people. I mean, there's just so much that you talked about that just seems like, uh, every university in this country is failing at. And so I would just love to hear from, you know, from the perspective of faculty who have been affiliated with um, big universities and also students who you know, probably grew up with an understanding of what university was. You know, what are some of the lessons that um, you know, really every university should be trying to take from your experience? Well, I'm actually going to merge that into a question that I'm going to uh, throw to my friend Jessica, which is I, I'm going to ask her to just talk sort of briefly about what MIT is doing well around this and then maybe turn this into an open question about what we feel like the universities that we know and love, whether we're at them now or whether you know, we're a proud Hampshire grad, what these can be doing uh, to sort of transform and work in solidarity with this movement. But Jessica, I'm gonna ask you first if you can. Um, so that was a high hard one there. That was, I had more lob when I was going to Joy, but it's hard when you're sitting. Do I speak into, oh. Just speak. <laughs> Um, hi, um, I'm Jessica from the MIT admissions office and first I just want to thank all of you for sharing your experiences and stories. They're incredibly humbling and inspiring for all of us to hear so I do want to thank you all. Um, as for what we're doing at MIT, um, MIT is one of the five schools in the country that um, offers need-blind admissions, need-based financial aid and full need financial aid to students regardless of citizenship. Um, again, that's one of five in this country. Um, there are other private institutions, um, some of the institutions you all named, private institutions, some state institutions that will provide financial aid to um, undocumented students or documented students, but um, the rules around this are, are pretty inconsistent. It can be really hard to navigate um, and find this information. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of questions that undocumented students have to think about that other students don't have to think about as they're navigating the college application process. Um, so the Media Lab has um, collaborated with us over the last few months to think about ways that we can mobilize resources at MIT and around Boston to serve local undocumented students. Obviously, Boston is a place that's really rich in educational resources. There are so many educational institutions in the area. So we've been trying to think about how can we, um, how can we serve this population um, here in Boston and in the greater Boston area. Um, some of the broad goals that, that I have for, for the work that we're doing together is to mobilize resources at MIT to build a network in the greater Boston area and to boost visibility around these, these movements and these resources. So we've been collaborating with local organizations like the Student Immigrant Movement, um, which is a um, activist organization that serves undocumented students in, um, in local high schools. Um, we've been working with Unafraid Educators, which is a part of the Boston Teachers Union, mm -hmm. um, which mobilizes educators to support undocumented students. Um, a program that we're putting on, or working with the um, Boston Teachers Union to put on is a guidance counselor training. They're hosting a day-long training for their guidance counselors in Boston public schools. We're working with them to um, host a discussion and panel around serving undocumented students, working with an immigration attorney to talk about what are the options for students, working with guidance counselors and student activists to talk about their journeys through the um, through education and what are the options for students and increasing some um, visibility around these issues, knowledge around these issues, so that those guidance counselors are then are then better empowered to right. work with the students in their schools. And, and sort of three big ideas came up when we were talking earlier today. One was looking at guidance counselors as uh, a real point of impact on this. It was really interesting to, to hear both of you sort of talk about not getting terrific guidance from your, your, your high school uh, guidance counselors about where to go and sort of how to go with this. Um, a second point, uh, and 
I thought this was particularly interesting is that um, Chris Peterson, a friend of, of many of ours in, in, in this room, talks about the fact that he often ends up seeing applications from people, sometimes undocumented, sometimes simply students who, who just didn't have as much of a chance in high school as some of us did, who clearly would be right for MIT had they taken the classes they needed to get into a place like MIT. And so there becomes this really interesting challenge of, for those of us here who are grad students, for those who are undergrads, is there a way that we could be involved in sort of reaching out to populations who could have the opportunity to be here, have this amazing opportunity to be here, need blind, citizenship blind, if they had the qualifications of it. And, and then the third that, that I was really blown away by was this, this realization that um, in the same way that your movement was building everything from Teamsters trying to figure out how to drive people there to people protecting and, and people thinking about, but lawyers, we need lawyers. You know, we need to help support students and their families when they're going through these issues. Even if the students are fully documented, but they're in a mixed family, where that becomes, I mean, imagine the level of stress if you find yourself simultaneously trying to manage an MIT course load and possibly being the only person in your house who's bilingual, helping your parents try to figure out how right. to stay. In the, in the country. For, for all of you, and we'll, we'll have this as the last question, what should universities be doing more? What can we do better at MIT, and what can we push the other universities that we love and care about to, to do better on on this issue? Well, I think uh, probably uh, the thing that I, that I haven't seen, because, um, you know, I've seen schools add another tab on their website that's information for undocumented students, right? And and the way that I that I that I see it, it's it's there's two sides, right? Uh, one side is the undocumented students looking to go to college. The other one is the universities, right. right? And there's a few universities that say, yeah, we have some resources, but and something you had asked earlier, like who could be against students learning, yeah. right? you'd be surprised. Yeah. A lot of people, <laughs> right. a lot of people can be against that and are against that. And that shows that between those two sides, those are the people that are, that are blocking access to those yeah. resources. And so I think more so than just adding another tab, more so than just creating a pamphlet, I think you need to be actively recruiting undocumented students because yeah. the <laughs> same way that you actively recruit other students who have a breadth of knowledge based on their lived experience, experiences, yep. yeah. we also have something to contribute. And yes. going back to your question about the biases that are, you know, uh, written uh, inherently into the system, I, I think that's where these, these, these knowledges, right, these, these uh, systems of knowledge that we have derived from our lived experiences, from our contacts, not just with, with you know, government, but like state institutions of all kinds. I think we can bring those into this into this place, and we can make good things with right. it. Um, but I think uh, again, you know, you need to be able to step uh, above and step beyond those people that are trying to block the access yeah. right. by actively recruiting and no, being public challenge. about it. Yes. Because not a lot of places are public about their admissions uh, policies when it comes to undocumented students and when it comes to financial aid. And so I think that once you become more visible to the students who are already taking a huge risk by becoming visible right. themselves, right. I, I think uh, that, that's sort of, uh, that, that's I think like the very first step that you, can, that you can take. Completely agree, that's so important. That is so important, I think that that's what's lacking at Harvard. I, so honestly though, this is a really interesting audience for me to speak to because oftentimes the things that we have to highlight is, I mean, we are already in a, I'm, 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 I'm part of Harvard and we're at MIT. It's already a very like prestigious, like very, you guys have a lot of funding and we're oftentimes talking to like community college, like students yeah. who can't even go to commu afford community college. So recognizing that, recognizing that, right? Recognizing that, I think Gustavo's point is really, really important for these elite institutions and private institutions who do have the funding to step it up. So one thing, one sad thing to recognize is that once Nancy Cantor, uh, Syracuse Chancellor, left and we had administrator change, they stopped funding undocumented students. Oh. So they stopped receiving undocumented students uh, through their private grants. So they, they 
So that's another avenue that's been closed. And a lot of the things that I pushed while I was there was to go public, but that was there was resistance to that. Um, so recognizing the the and also recognizing the labor of uh, a Lorja who's not here and all the faculties who are here, there was a lot of risks and a lot of labor, a lot of time that they put in on top of their obligation as like the only ethnic studies professor at UGA, right? The only like woman of color, one of the few who have like how many students that they're advising that they had opened up their space to dedicate their time to make a space for Un Freedom University. I think that needs to happen at MIT. I think that needs to happen at, yeah. at Harvard. I think there needs to be a step up of investment and a coalition building and a little bit more of courage to like to to contest and to stop telling us what the rules of what how how complex these bureau, bureaucratic and, and uh, academic institutions and red tapes are I already, we already know that that yeah. there are red tapes <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. we're asking you to step up administrators need to step up students and grad students need to step up I think one of the most uh, disheartening thing that I've actually experienced organizing at Harvard has been this constant um, uh, separation between undergraduates and graduate students. So, uh, undocumented. I mean, I'm, an, I'm still undocumented. I'm, I'm in the graduate program, um, but there's been a constant separation between the investment. I mean, an investment within the, the needs of an undergraduate students and graduate students. And our needs are different, but they're still the same. Like, what does it mean to to ha bring in undocumented students as graduate students? What does it mean for them to be teaching fellows when they don't have DACA? Yeah. Like, these questions need to be asked. And the only way you're going to get answers and insight is, as Gustavo said, center and invite undocumented students and actually hear what their needs are and, and advocating for them. Because there's still a lot of anxieties that even someone who, you know, might have the, the perfect GPA and might have the extracurriculars, there's a lot of anxiety because you, you just don't know. Yeah. You don't yeah. know. Mm. And I think that, that, you know, part of being public, I think, would also work to, on, on this other front that I think has been very, very lacking. And I don't know if, like, people have actually thought about it or brought it up, but you know, shaming these other institutions yeah. mm -hmm. into, into coming and living in the present, right? Not staying in the past, not staying in this, in, this, in this way of thinking where, okay, education still needs to be segregated somehow because that makes us feel like we still have power over the systems that, that be, right? And I think that, you know, a place like MIT with the cloud that it has, and, and if it starts being public and if it starts actively recruiting undocumented yeah. students, I think yeah. that can also have a domino effect or a shaming effect upon these other big institutions to yeah. step it up themselves. Because if there's anything that I learned about higher education is that no institution wants to fall behind another institution. <laughs> so one of the things we, we talked about a little bit over lunch was the ways in which um, MIT will often do things right, but very quietly. Right. Uh, and this is a place where we're doing things right. Uh, we, we are, by being need blind and by being citizenship blind, that's, that's the right step. We need to go a step further, and, and we need to, to be open and affirming about this. I will openly affirm that I welcome and encourage undocumented students to apply to my group here at the Media Lab. I hope that others will do that as well. Uh, but beyond that, this is something that, that we as MIT should have a lot of pride in. We should actually be talking up and, and actively recruiting around uh, on a bunch of different... I think all of us who inhabit more secure positions in these institutions need to help shift the perspective and make clear that there is not a neutral space when what you're seeing, people like y'all are carrying the brunt of 40 years of deliberate constriction of access to higher education in this country. And to, you can either counteract that process or you can simply shrug your shoulders and enable it but there's not actually, there's no moment where it holds still. Mm -hmm. This was a deliberate political move to make it harder for that vast expansion of uh, access to education. Everyone had a full ride in California in 1960 if they could get into college, mm -hmm. right? And that's no longer how we do that because it stopped being simply available to white Americans and that was the moment where it started to contract. And any of us who work in these institutions owe it to the people who are taking the heat to figure out where our institution is in that history 
and what steps we can take uh, from within to counteract that. Yeah. I'm going to give the last word to Bettina, and then we're going to we're going to welcome anyone who wants to stick around. We're going to go and have a a smaller discussion over in MySpace and Civic. Uh, but Bettina, please. Yeah, I just take want us out. to support what what Gustavo and Keish were saying, um, and I want to add to that that undocumented students are not a risk for an institution. They are the best. Um, they bring in a lot of experience, and they turn out staying in college. We, in ULID Athens, we, ha we had help around 50 students to get into college. From those 50, as far as I know, only one left. All of them are in, in school. They are continuing uh, struggling. Some of them are taking two classes per semester, three classes per semester, but they don't withdraw. And, and I think that that is uh, something that all colleges have to have into account. They are more secure <laughs> than other students that might not finish, might not end up graduating. So I just want to thank my guests for coming out talking about these issues. I just want to congratulate you all for the incredible work that Freedom University has done. I want to thank everyone who came out in the audience, everyone who's watching us online. We're going to continue this conversation. We're hoping to have a very practical conversation about what we can do better here in Boston for people who are still engaged with us. Come on over into the civic space. We'll be there in a couple of minutes, but thank you all for coming out and being part of this. <laughs>